thanks Dr. Stevenson and Professor Wright. I feel like a lot of people here are in Professor Wright's class, correct? Yes. Cool. Um, I probably, this is the fourth time I've spoken in the James Weldon Johnson lecture series. Like I said, two of the previous talks I gave ended up as published essays. So I really like this series because it's like, you know, I'm working out my ideas and then uh, doing my own professional development as well as, uh, you know, sharing these thoughts with you and getting a better idea of what I'm trying to say. And uh, so we're really producing, producing research here as well as uh, doing a, a teaching moment. So today I thought uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, I think the title is uh, African American and Haitian Solidarity from the Battle of Savannah to Haiti's Bicentenary in 2004. And uh, I've I talked a lot about Haiti since the earthquake in January. And it seems like every time I get to the uh, point of collecting my thoughts, I don't even want to talk about the earthquake really. What I want to talk about more is how it is that we think about Haiti and to use the occasion to uh, speak about Haiti to address the issue of what is our mental image of Haiti. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover some of that today in the middle of the talk. I am going to start off with some slides and, and show you what I saw when we traveled there with my research team at the beginning of the summer. And then the last part of the talk is going to be addressing the African-American Haitian connection, which is a really long-standing connection. And I think that it's very important because it's such an act of mental, almost warfare, to try to maintain a positive point of view on Haiti. Yeah, because the, the point of view that you get through uh, most media outlets and uh, books and films and so on over the years has been so uh, distorted that it's hard to really have a, a clear and, and sympathetic view of Haiti. However, African American history, culture, politics is one point where I think there is a, a, a legacy of viewing Haiti more in more realistic terms, like let's say viewing Haiti almost as Haitians view Haiti, rather than as uh, people from the outside view the country. And so that, that Haitian African American linkage is really important to the mental task of uh, orienting yourself to think clearly and sympathetically about Haiti. So those are the three parts of the talk. This is a really good shot of the place where we stayed in Port-au-Prince. We stayed in the Criswa neighborhood. Anybody from Haiti in here? Any Haitians, Haitian Americans? So you know Port-au-Prince at all? Okay, so this is, this is Criswa, which is uh, a little bit up the hill from downtown Port-au-Prince, and uh, maybe about Delma 30, if you were you know, thinking about how high up the, high up the hill it is. But you can see that there's a lot of devastation there. You can see there are a lot of houses still standing. And you can also see the Haitian flag flying proudly, which is, to me, a, a perfect image for how it is there. Next, next slide. So this is a good example of some of the, de the devastation from the earthquake. And uh, what was really striking about this image is that right next to it was a house that was two, three stories high that was completely untouched and was still standing, people were living in it. So there's a certain randomness to the, to the devastation that we're still trying to figure out. And I think a lot of it has to do with how people built their houses before the earthquake. And if you, you, know, if you had enough rebar reinforcing the concrete, or if you mixed your concrete right and didn't stretch it out and have too much water in the mix, then you had a chance of your house surviving. And uh, if you were economizing on rebar or the cement mix, then you, you, know, you had a problem and your, your house came down. But it was, it was striking to me how you had this kind of devastation and then right next to it a house still standing. We saw a lot of activity in Port-au-Prince and uh, people clearing the rubble out. You'll still see scenes like this where they're moving it uh, courtyard by courtyard, uh, loading up the wheelbarrows with uh, cement rubble and moving it out into the street and then, uh, then uh, either shoveling it into a, a, a pickup truck or a backhoe could actually scoop it up by machine and, and load it in. And this was a good image actually because you can see that they are uh, sponsored by USAID. So that was a sign that some of the relief money was actually getting down to the ground level. It's still a big issue about you know all these millions of dollars, billions of dollars really have been 
uh, earmarked for Haiti and relief and recovery after the earthquake, but how much of it is actually getting to people. And it's still a problem. However, I was encouraged when I saw this crew. This is also in the uh, courtyard of the place that we stayed, which used to be a guest house. Now is, uh, they, they made temporary shelters, set up a medical clinic, set up a dental clinic. So there's a lot of, a lot of activity going on in transitional shelters in this uh, courtyard. But this was the work crew and shows you that uh, there is, there is uh, effort going on to clear out the rubble. It's not finished yet because when it's done by hand, it takes a long time. Uh, this is a shot that my, my shot capturing the tent city phenomenon and you know that there were upwards of 300,000 people perished in the earthquake 1.5 to 1.75 million people were displaced and they're in, in the in the development relief lingo they're called IDPs internally displaced persons and the IDPs of, of that number maybe 750,000 at least are living in uh, tent cities in and around Port-au-Prince, some up in Pétionville, up the, up the hill. If you've never been to Port-au-Prince, it's, it's set on the seashore, but it goes immediately up, up the side of a mountain. And some of the, some of the tent cities are, are further up the mountain. Some of them are out in the uh, surrounding countryside. 750,000 at least in the tent cities. And so they have their own vibe, and it's, it's, a, it's a very vibrant scene inside the tent cities. You have uh, like all the problems that you would have in a big city. So you have uh, violence against women. You have violence against against general people. But you also have uh, you also have restaurants. You have discotheques. You have medical clinics. You even have barber shops in the tent cities. And uh, it's it's still an evolving scene. Since we were there in May. Now, some of those have been uh, built almost as squatter camps on somebody else's land, and some of those big landlords have been getting uh, really upset about it, and they've actually carried out some evictions of some of the tent cities. So that's a, 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 a troubling a dynamic, you know, added to whatever other negatives there are with the tent cities. Now there's an issue with people getting actually evicted from uh, the camps that they're in. But that's a really heavy part of the scene now are these, are these tent cities. We saw a lot of new construction going on uh, and every time I was driving and I saw one I tried to take a snapshot of, uh, you know, of, of new building going on. Unfortunately I didn't really, I was kind of uh, distressed at this and we saw a lot of cases where it seemed like people were just building in exactly the same ways that had resulted in a uh, collapse of a building previously. So they're using the same uh, methods which is not enough concrete and not enough rebar and I was traveling uh, with a couple of engineers and they looked at that and they were like you know there's the rebar is supposed to be spaced more closely and they've spread they spread it out too far because they're saving money but what's going to happen is if there's an aftershock or another earthquake that that is going to come right down and we saw that repeatedly that while there is you know, you feel good about the uh, activity and when you see people getting it together to rebuild their, their houses and stores and whatnot, despite the bottleneck with the aid money. When you see that the same construction methods are being used in many cases, then that's, that's uh, cause for some distress. We also saw a lot of commerce. So uh, even, though, even though there was this major disruption in the society, this is still produce from the countryside coming into the city and being sold into markets along uh, along uh, the road heading out to the, the south and the west. We, 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 were, we were heading south and west to Laogon, and so there's a, that's a major commercial thoroughfare, and the markets were very much in, 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 you know, in operation. Go ahead. Uh, this is another scene along the same route, and it shows you that, uh, again, commerce is happening, although I, this is, again, a double-edged sword for me in this picture because this is the Chabon, which is the uh, charcoal that people make out of trees. And when you study Haiti, you, you immediately find out about the problem of deforestation and the fact that the, uh, the country is like 98% devoid of trees and, and that remaining 2% is going, going gone. And the main reason is that people chop down the trees to make charcoal. That's, how they, that's, that's the preferred method of cooking is with the charcoal made from trees. So on the one hand, you have bustling commerce, and on the other hand, you can see that the ecological uh, problems are still mounting 
with the use of the of charcoal like that. That's our team. Uh, mix of Haitian and, and American researchers. Uh, you heard in my intro we were researching the use of mobile communication devices, uh, text messaging. Few people had Blackberries. People used it for uh, just talking. We wanted to see how, how, how well did the cell network stand up <coughs> in the wake of the earthquake and uh, how did people use them to try to solve their, solve their crises. This is another uh, shot of, at the place where we stayed in Port-au-Prince and this is, this is another piece of our team. We interviewed people from the United Nations Development Program, and this is a guy who uh, was uh, running communications for UNDP. We also interviewed corporate people. This is a shot of the made uh, Digicel Haiti headquarters in Port-au-Prince, and we had some really uh, good meetings with the corporate uh, element, and uh, you know, and even laid the groundwork for some partnership. Because as we go forward with our research, we want to try to use cell phones, smartphones, um, <clears throat> as, a, as a platform for learning. So, because, you know, a lot of schools got destroyed, a lot of universities got destroyed. And so we thought one way to remedy that situation was to figure out how to introduce smartphones and our uh, research partners over in Research Park and the Institute for Simulation and Training. They do a lot of military stuff, but they also do a lot of <laughs> curriculum development stuff. And they've actually developed a platform that lets you put your, like your web courses onto a smartphone. And then you can uh, trans transfer that into a Haitian setting. And when the walls have fallen down and they haven't been rebuilt yet at the universities, we could still think about constructing a virtual university. And Digicel was really interested in that. And they will probably help us with uh, uh, making a, a data plan available at a, at a really minimal price. So that was, that was also part of our research. We met with government officials. This is a great picture. This is the mayor of Leogan, which is the city, the next biggest city to the west of, uh, south and west of Port-au-Prince, and uh, really was the epicenter for the earthquake. Leogan was flattened. Port-au-Prince, you know, as I said, had, had uh, this one collapsed, this one remained standing. Leogan was pretty much flattened uh, all around. But I like this picture because the mayor, you can see, they've done really good uh, triage on their, on their uh, municipality and their region. So each one of these is a critical area where they needed water or they needed health or they wanted some transitional shelters built or whatever it might be. The point is, you could see that they had a plan and he pulled out, he pulled out the plan and showed us this is what we have uh, in store and what our, what, our, uh, you know, what our needs are and our plan for meeting those needs. We're just waiting for the resources to uh, go through and do that. So we also uh, went way out in the countryside and met with peasant associations. And this is a, a good uh, picture of a peasant association where we, we had a survey that we, were, that we were trying to deliver to people and get them to uh, give us their responses on these issues of how they use their cell phones, as well as uh, how they saw the various aid and relief agencies interacting with each other. And uh, so, uh, at this particular meeting, 150 peasants came from all around the Jacmel area in southern Haiti and uh, crowded into this little shack. And all of them filled out our survey. We collected 110 surveys in one go. It was great. And we also were surveying at universities. And this is a university at, uh, in the countryside all the, way, all the way in the west, the end of the southwest peninsula. If you know the geography of Haiti, it has this little boot that goes out, and Jerry Me is the city all the way at the end of the peninsula, and we wanted to survey in an area that had not been touched by the, by the physical damage from the earthquake, and indeed, Jeremy was untouched. However, they had an influx of refugees, people in, internally displaced persons that migrated to Jerry Me, and so we surveyed at the University of Nouvelle Grand Anse. Grand Anse is the name of the province and the University of Nouvelle Grand Anse is the name of the university. And so that was another part of our uh, research, was to touch base with the university crowd. We took time for good food. This is what lunch looks like in Jacques Mel. You can get this really excellent uh, uh, grilled snapper and plantain and pick leaves on the beach in Jacques Mel. And Prestige is the beer in Haiti. If you're a beer drinker, it's good. 
Also, this is where we stayed in Jeremy, just to let you know that everything is not devastation. We stayed in this beautiful 200-year-old uh, gingerbread house in Jeremy. This is the ancestral home of the uh, man who's the president of the university. His name is Maxime Rumer, and uh, he's also a senator. <laughs> he's the senator from Grand Anse, and uh, he made his house available to us. Just so you can see, not everything is devastation in Haiti. There's also a beautiful life to be lived there and we got a little piece of it. That's the wraparound porch. You can see how nice it is. If you look out the window, if you look out the top window in that house, you can see out to the ocean. It's just spectacular. So I thought this was a good uh, image to ca encapsulate kind of what's happening. You, you see a lot of people sitting around like this guy. If I ever work on this photo, I'm gonna blow this one up and just look at that man sitting there on the second floor kind of in a daze and trying to take stock of his life and what's left of it. And the next one. Um, and we saw a lot of people walking around like that. But at the same time, there's a lot of activity. This is a good example of how the backhoe is clearing out some of the rubble and putting it into a dump truck for removal. Every time I saw uh, fields in, in cultivation, that made me happy and, and made me see that there's uh, activity going on in the countryside. Uh, every time I saw, every time I see a Creole pig, I get happy because uh, if you know the history of Haiti, they tried to eradicate the pigs, the black Creole pigs in the 1980s. That was a, a longer digression, but uh, at any rate, it's a key, this is a key foundation of peasant culture in the countryside, <coughs> and uh, they're coming back. And, and, and this is actually at the University of Nouvelle Grand Anse out in Jeremy. They have a veterinary program, and they're actually growing uh, uh, large number of pigs on the on the campus and this is a little nursery these are baby pigs and so another sign that the country is is you know is still functioning and actually growing and moving forward now this image I don't know how well you can see this this was another one that I thought was uh, uh, iconic figure uh, figure and a symbolic figure for the whole Haitian people right now this man is well this is a charrier what he's pulling it's a cart you know, like a, 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 cargo, a cargo cart. And people use those to pull, usually they're pulling around produce and, and stuff like that, smaller objects, and uh, they, they haul them from place to place. This guy has strapped a vehicle onto the back of his charrier, and he's actually pulling it up an incline. This isn't even like on flat land. He's, he's going uphill with this, with this car. So I thought that was a good uh, image to talk about how hard people are, are uh, struggling. And of course, you go to Haiti, you find Haitian children are the most photogenic children on the planet. And uh, when they see a camera, they come running. OK. <laughs> so those are some impressions. And I think what I, what I want you to uh, take away from that, uh, besides whatever, whatever impressions you might have in looking at those uh, images, is that this is a country that is suffering, but at the same time is functioning and coming back and that there are a lot of positive threads of Haitian society. There have been over time, and they have not been all destroyed by the earthquake. And I think, what can you do to try to orient yourself towards that view of Haiti, which is a complex vision of both the problems that it has as well as the beauty that it has? And I thought the first thing you can do in order to orient yourself is to sing a song. And uh, the song is Aiti Sheri, which means Beloved Haiti. And I think our, our speakers aren't working, so I can sing it. I'll just sing some of the, some of the lines and uh, let you know how it sounds. So it goes, Haiti, chérie, pi bon pays passe ou nan point. Faut que moi te quitte ou, pour moi te cap comprendre valé ou. Faut que moi te manque ou, pour moi te cap apprécié ou. Haiti, chérie, c'est un pays qui me cher. And it goes on like that. Beautiful song. It has like 40, 45 verses or something. And uh, I think that that to me is a really good starting point for the mental task of orienting yourself towards uh, a more complicated, a more sophisticated, a more sympathetic view of the country to embrace IET Sherry. And I think, uh, oh, there's, some, there's an English version of it done by Harry Belafonte. And, uh, I wish, I wish you could hear that, but it's, that's how it goes. Um, but it's a really nice version, and I, and I was really happy to find this, because I think in my, in my youth, 
when I was ignorant, I used to think of Harry Belafonte. Any you people know who he is? Harry Belafonte? I used to think of him as like a tropical Burl Ives when I was growing up, which is, which is not a very positive perception of him. And I used to think that his music was kind of uh, schmaltzy or cheesy or it was, you know, it was, it was packaging it, packaging Caribbean folk music for consumption in the United States, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, as I grew older and tried to understand him better, I realized that he was, for one thing, he was pan-Caribbean. He didn't just, he, I, think he's, I think he's Virgin Islander. I think that's where his, where his family's from. And, uh, and he is not just focused on his own thing. He actually writes and sings in multiple languages. And he does like this, where he takes a song from Haiti, translates it in English. And so he makes the song available to an English language audience that might not understand Creole. And he does the same thing with songs from Cuba and Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Can sing them either in Spanish or in, in an English translation. So he's pan-Caribbean. And I really uh, came to admire that about him. And you know, then as he went on in his, in his life and his acting career and his political activism against the apartheid regime, um, and he was a, a very, uh, very active in the Obama campaign in 2008, now I look at him and I see somebody like a tropical Paul Robeson rather than tropical Burl Ives. And uh, anyway, that's just a little aside on Harry Belafonte. But what I want to say now is uh, three things that you can do to rethink how you think about Haiti, okay? If it's a mental challenge to try to get to that point of view of IET Sheri, how do you get there? I think you can, and I think there are some mental things that you can do. And uh, there are, I'm going to present three things that I think you often hear about Haiti. And then uh, very briefly, what you can do to counter those negative statements. So when somebody says Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, you say first country in the world to abolish slavery, which is, a, which is true and which is a good rebuttal to the first statement. Now. I do want to, you know, I'm, time is going to run out, so I, I'm just going to zip through these slides. But I wanted to try to uh, share with you some language from the Haitian Constitution. So what does it mean to be the first country in the world to abolish slavery? Well, it's actually written into the Haitian Constitution. Article 2, slavery is forever abolished. And we know how long it took for that to happen in the United States and how far down in the articles, in the, in the, the amendments to the Constitution, not the articles, but the amendments to the US Constitution, till you got to emancipation. There it is right there. Um, interesting stuff about citizenship, land tenure, and race politics. The main thing I wanna, I wanna emphasize here is this one, which is that they have abolished, they have abolished color distinctions in Haiti. So you know that, that, that this country was really riven by the split between black, white, and mulatto in the time of the colonial uh, era and then the revolutionary struggle, which was 13 years long. When Dessalines became uh, the ruler of Haiti in 1804, and it was an in, became an independent country, he eliminated color distinctions. But look at how he solved it. Haitians shall hen henceforward be known only by the generic appellation of blacks. So. How are, we going to, how are we going to eliminate color? We're going to put everybody on the same category as black, regardless of what your uh, skin tone is or where you came from, what your parents or grandparents did, where they were from. Everybody will be considered to be black. And I don't know how that registers for you in 2010 in the state of Florida, but I, f I find that to be a very challenging point of view, but also a really liberating point of view. And it basically is... Uh, you know, it's saying that black humanity is the index for humanity. And if we can embrace black humanity, we cover the whole spectrum. We cover everybody on the planet. And uh, I think that was one of the most amazing things about the, about the Haitian constitution and, you know, the, the legacy of Haiti in, the, in, in not just the Western Hemisphere, but really globally. They also wrote religious tolerance into the constitution. And I think this is an amazing uh, legacy. The law admits of no predominant religion, freedom of worship is tolerated, and the state does not provide for the maintenance of any religious institution, nor any minister. I mean, this is a very, very enlightened stance to take. And uh, it's not to say that there are not 
strife uh, in Haiti as elsewhere over the issue of religion. But I think that the, the, the fact that they took time to put that in the Constitution is worth noting and it's worth you know, holding up there as an ideal to aspire to as far as religious tolerance. And then that brings us to the next set of uh, things that you would hear about Haiti and uh, one of the most, one of the most uh, volatile, troubling things is the, is the depiction of voodoo and what people think about voodoo. And so typically what I hear when people are saying that it's negative and why we can't embrace it or we can't even tolerate it is that voodoo is demonic. Voodoo is demonic. And I think that there, these are some things you can say in response to that idea. First of all, you can say voodoo is ancestor reverence. Voodoo is also praise dance. If you've ever seen, if you've ever been to a voodoo ceremony or seen a film of a voodoo ceremony, a lot of it is the processing around the potomitan, the center pole in the, in the voodoo temple. And it's really sacred da or praise dance. Also, voodoo is herbal medicine. Many of the voodoo priests and priestesses, what they do is practice traditional herbal medicine. And people go to them because they can get physical healing as well as psychological counseling for things that are troubling them. <clears throat> the theologically, voodoo is a mystical union with the divine. If you know what happens in a, in a uh, experience of spirit possession, it's like the spirit actually comes down and inhabits the body of the person. And uh, to me, that has its corollary in a lot of so-called Western or Judeo-Christian, uh, even Islamic traditions. There are mystic traditions in all of these uh, mainline religions, and I think that the, the the voodoo theology is no different than that when it comes to understanding what's happening and what the relationship is to the divine. It's actually maybe a little bit, you know, it pushes the, whereas mysticism, the direct contact with the divine is probably a marginal uh, aspect of the mainline religions, Judeo-Christian and Islamic, the Abrahamic religions. Maybe in voodoo, the mysticism is more front and center, it's more prominent but it's got its corollary in the religions that we might be more familiar with. It's also plus or minus 40,000 years old. Now, I've, I've read some people that say that. I've read some that say 5,000, some that say 10,000. So there's some dispute about the, the, the origins and how far back voodoo goes. But if you go to Benin, the country where it's, uh, is, is its, its seedbed in uh, West Africa, you will find plenty of people to tell you that this has been practiced, this is a tradition that's 40,000 years old, 40,000. So just on that basis alone, I would say it deserves respect. But you know, think back to the uh, Constitution of Haiti and the idea of religious tolerance. And that ought to be another uh, you know, final platform to stand on when you get into a discussion about voodoo and how to think about it. The last thing that, that I said there were three that you could uh, hear a negative statement about Haiti, but then how do you rethink that and what can you do mentally to respond and rebut? Well, there's a very uh, prevalent statement that I've heard frequently since the time of the earthquake in January, which is that there is no government and that this is impeding the recovery process, some variation on that, on that statement. <clears throat> and I think you can rebut that. First of all, there is local government. Remember the picture of the guy in the uh, mayor's office from Leogon, and remember the, the, the aerial map that was on his desk and all of the details in it. There, and you could repeat that scene in, in local office after local office, all the way down to the remotest uh, village and peasant association. They may not have an aerial map, but they clearly know what is happening in the surrounding uh, terrain and what they need to do to try to meet their, you know, meet their, their challenges and improve their situation. There's local government. And uh, you know, the fact that the national government in Haiti has a lot of problems does not negate the fact that there is, there is local government and that our aid agencies ought to be trying to connect at that level. There's peasant associations, go ahead, women's groups, youth and student groups, neighborhood brigades if you're in the city, and trade unions. All of these, all of these are, uh, uh, what do you call them? Non-governmental actors. They're, you know, they're the they're the, the the civil society. There's something outside the elected officials, but they're very much involved in organizing all of the resources and and getting done what needs to be done. And in fact, you know, as uh, the immediate aftermath of the earthquake up until the present day, 
these are the groups that are really doing the work in the countryside as things are bottled up in Port-au-Prince, as there are problems with getting the money distributed to whoever might be able to do something with it. These are the groups that are actually helping people on a day in, day out basis, especially in the countryside. So there is local government and there is a local uh, structure to society. And to, to talk about Haiti as if it's just chaos is uh, you know, very much a, a outside perception and I think a, a faulty perception. And these would be some of the ways to get in to a more, you know, a more, uh, uh, I guess a more, a, a more accurate view of the reality in Haiti. Okay, so now I'm transitioning to the third part of the talk, which is the, what was actually advertised, which is the African-American Haitian connection from the Battle of Savannah to the Haitian Bicentenary. And the reason why I wanted to focus on this is because having done the first two parts of the, of the talk, I think I'm, I'm hoping you get the idea that it's not easy to maintain a clear, uh, rational, and possibly sympathetic view of Haiti. And it's a, a real mental exercise. It's a struggle. So where can you find the, you know, the, the mental foundation to stand on to have that point of view of embracing IET Sherry? And my, my argument is that African-American history, culture, politics, all the way back to 1779 at the, at the minimum. That's just a good starting point for the talk, but you know, it's, it's a long-standing tradition of interaction. So the Battle of Savannah in uh, the uh, Revolutionary War, the American Revolution, it started as a siege in 1779, and actually this was the first time when the French were coming into the war on behalf of the uh, Continental Army. And the guy's name was Valerie Destang, he was a general and an admiral, and he uh, raised a an, an, uh, force of about 900 people in Saint-Domingue, which was the, col the colonial name of Haiti. And they sailed to Savannah, and they put a blockade on Savannah. And then uh, they, on October 9th, they actually tried to storm the British uh, position there at Savannah. And it was not a positive experience because uh, they had sort of wait, they'd waited too long and they let the British build up their defenses. And so there it was actually a tactical uh, defeat for the, the French and the, and the Continental forces. However, it was about to be a massacre. It was about to be game over for the Continental Army. And it was the Haitian troops that had been uh, recruited by Valerie Destang, the, the French admiral, that actually protected the retreat. So as they realized that they were getting uh, chopped to pieces, and by the way, this was, up to this point, was the bloodiest single day of, of combat in the American Revolutionary War. A thousand people were, were killed in about an hour. So it was huge casualties on the continental side. I think about 30, 30 British were killed in the same period. So it was very uh, unequal, and, uh, and it was very bad for the continental forces. However, it was the Haitians that protected that retreat and made it possible for the Continental Army to get back onto the ships, sail away, and live to fight another day. And so they have finally uh, put a monument to the Haitian soldiers in Savannah. Let's see the next one. And these are some of the Haitian people that went on to be Haitian uh, patriots when then a couple years later, Haiti had its own revolution. Andre Rigaud, Jean-Baptiste Chavon, these are two mulatto uh, heroes from the revolutionary period. Chavon was there, and this, there's not really any good pictures of him, but this particular soldier in, the, in this, the monument is supposed to be Chavon. He led an uprising in Saint-Domingue in 1791, and it was a very unsuccessful outcome, and he was drawn and quartered in the public square in uh, what was then Cap Francois, it's now Cap Haitien in the northern part of the country, but he's a, a national hero. Andre Rigaud was a great general, survived, uh, as you can see, to 1811, so he survived into independence. And Henri Christophe was uh, actually one of the, one, he was the king of Haiti. When it was an independent country, initially it was divided into north and south. There was the Republic of Haiti in the south and the Kingdom of Haiti in the north, and Henri Christophe was the, one of the kings. And uh, all three of these people, he was actually supposed to be 12 or 13 years old, and he was the drummer boy. So if you go back, can you go back a slide? Yeah, this is supposed to be Henri Christophe 
That's supposed to be Siobhan and, um, go ahead. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is read a little bit from my book. Because this is something that I took time to try to distill. And so what I say is that the Haitian Revolution uh, in 1791 to 1804, that it immediately impressed African Americans and the memory of it was kept alive during the 19th century in speeches, pamphlets, and visits to Haiti by black abolitionists such as Prince Saunders, William Wells Brown, James T. Holly, and Frederick Douglass. Even before word of the colonial uprising in Saint-Domingue reached North America, though, Haitians had established a North American presence during the American Revolution by fighting as French soldiers <clears throat> during the Battle of Savannah. This military experience proved invaluable to the Haitians when their own War of Independence erupted a decade later, and they faced and defeated Spanish, British, and finally two separate French expeditionary forces. Haiti fired the dreams of African Americans, particularly those with revolutionary leanings. In Charleston, South Carolina, Denmark Vesey, I think we can go to the next one. Denmark Vesey, uh, leader of one of the most detailed plans for antebellum revolt, was himself of Caribbean descent and lived for a year in Saint-Domingue before coming to Charleston in 1783. And actually he was able to, when his, his uh, so-called owner was a, a, a sea merchant and he left him in Saint-Domingue and then went and did his, uh, his commerce. And while he was away for a year, uh, Denmark Vesey was actually uh, bought a lottery ticket and his lottery number came in and he used the winnings to buy his freedom. So when he, when he went to Charleston, he went as a freed black rather than as a slave. Forty years later, Vesey's co-conspirators co firmly believed they would receive support from Haitian as well as African sources for their efforts to overthrow white supremacist rule in black majority South Carolina. If you want to read more about Denmark Vesey, there's a really good book by John O'Killens called The Trial Record of Denmark Vesey. F really, really fascinating uh, document. The Trial Record of Denmark Vesey. Throughout, and this is, this is a picture of the house. If you go to Charleston, you can see Denmark Vesey's house at 56 Bull Street. And this is an artist's uh, imagining of Denmark Vesey. The guy's name is Charles White, and he actually painted a mural. Uh, he was a WPA artist in the 30s and 40s, influenced, actually studied with uh, Diego Rivera, the great Mexican muralist. And he painted a mural representing African-American contributions to democracy at Hampton Institute. So if you ever find yourself at Hampton, you go and look for the mural, and you'll see you'll see this uh, face mixed in with all of the other people in the tableau. Go ahead. So then you get to the mid-19th century, and Haiti was frequently viewed by colonization societies. These are groups that try to figure out what to do with freed people of color in the United States. They call them colonization societies. And so one of the things that, that, that some people considered was emigrating. They were also known as emigration societies. But Haiti was frequently viewed by these groups as a place where free blacks from the United States might emigrate. An actual emigration to Haiti reached a peak in the late 1850s under the influence of James T. Holly, an Episcopal minister, who moved to the island with his family and took up permanent residence. He was from D.C. originally. Holly gallicized his first name. Later accounts refer to him as Jacques. That means he, he Frenchified it. He changed his name from James to Jacques and he accepted a standing offer of Haitian citizenship to any person of African descent. Holly survived well into the 20th century, and his letters to correspondents in North America offer a rare, sympathetic perspective on society and politics in turn-of-the-century Haiti. Contact between Haitians and African Americans dramatically increased during the generation preceding Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, which are my uh, favorites as a literature professor, and how I got into all of this stuff was through studying Hurston and Hughes, and let's go to the next slide. Frederick Douglass, hopefully we all know who he is. One of the things he did in the 1880s was that he worked very hard to deliver the black vote to Republican candidate Benjamin Harrison in the presidential election of 1888. And as a result, he was appointed high consul to Haiti where he served from 1889 to 1891. 1889 to 1891. Douglas's public talks from the time recognized the dignity of Haitian people who walk, he says, quote, as if conscious of their freedom and independence, end quote. 
His diplomatic dispatches, meanwhile, demand respect for Haiti from the international community and paint scenes of bustling development in Port-au-Prince. In one description of the Haitian capital, Douglas notes, quote, the manifold projects for improving streets, roads, and wharves, and the increasing number of private dwellings in process of erection both within and without the limits of Port-au-Prince. The sound of the hammer and trowel is heard late and early. Soon an electric cable from Port-au-Prince will connect the cable at Mole Saint-Nicolas and thus bring Port-au-Prince on rapport with the outside world. So Haiti is a site of modernization and a site of modern culture rather than as many of the travel logists were writing at the time, uh, a, 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 a place of primitive culture and, and they actually use the idea and the image and the language of the return to the jungle. So you have a black republic, that equals a return to the jungle for a lot of writers at this time. But Douglas is you know, giving you a very strong counter narrative of Haiti as a, a place of modern industrial activity. Ultimately, he resigned his commission because uh, the US had attempted to bully Haitians into leasing Mole Saint Nicolas as, which they wanted as a coaling station for their navy. And he refused to carry water for the State Department after a certain period of time and uh, resigned. And really, I think, you know, in his sensitivity to Haitian interests, his, he's a unique chapter in diplomatic history, U.S. diplomatic history. And the Haitians later acknowledged his support by making him their representative at the Colombian Exposition in 1893. And black people were actually banned from attending this. It was a segregated event. But Douglas got to attend because he was running the Haiti, the Haiti Pavilion at this exhibit and gave this beautiful lecture on Haiti. It's been reprinted. And uh, that's about Douglas and Haiti. During the 30s, Hurston resided in Haiti. Zora Neale Hurston resided in Haiti as a Guggenheim scholar during, doing fieldwork research on voodoo. Jacob Lawrence inaugurated his famous series format in painting with a set of 41 captioned canvases. Let's jump ahead a couple of frames. Yeah, there we go. There's Langston and Zora. Go ahead, one more. There we go. Uh, Jacob Lawrence inaugurated his famous series format in painting with a uh, set of 41 captioned canvases titled The Life of Toussaint Louverture. And this is my favorite right here. It's called Contemplation. You can see I used it for the title or for the cover image on my book and uh, a beautiful image because it shows Toussaint the hero of the Haitian Revolution as a as a thinker and a writer look at what he's doing he's sitting at a desk reading by candlelight and there's more books up on the bookshelf in the upper right hand corner and I think this is a great image of uh, engaged intellectual activity this is a general this is a fighting person but this is also a thinking person a reading and a writing person and uh, I think this is just an amazing image that, that Jacob Lawrence put together to capture. And there are, there are 40, other, you know, 40 other images like that depicting the life of Toussaint. This is the photograph of Jacob Lawrence. And then he's, he also has a lot of really excellent self-portraits. And that's a good self-portrait of Jacob Lawrence. Uh, Langston, go back one. Langston Hughes lived in Haiti during his own travels, lived in Haiti during his own travels throughout the Caribbean, wrote the moving protest essay, The White Shadows in a Black Land, as well as The People Without Shoes, the latter of which was subsequently incorporated as a chapter in Hughes's autobiography, I Wonder as I Wander. Before that, go back one more, James Weldon Johnson had spearheaded a determined effort by black intellectuals in America to influence US policies during the American occupation in Haiti. And you may not know this, but Haiti was occupied by U.S. Marines from 1915 to 1934. It was, a, it was an, like we're in Iraq now, or like we're in Afghanistan. We were in Haiti in 1915 to 1934. And there were a lot of atrocities and abuses committed by the uh, occupation forces. And the NAACP was, the, you know, was the, the advocate to try to expose all of that and do what they could to uh, mitigate it and turn public opinion and public policy in a more positive direction. And James Weldon Johnson, who is the namesake for this series and who you should know is from Jacksonville, Florida. He's a native Floridian. He was the field secretary of the NAACP. And the man had previously been a diplomat in Nicaragua and he spoke umpteen languages. So he was the, he was the person to take on this mission. 
and he went down and did his, uh, you know, his scrutiny of the occupation and his, and his investigation of Haiti, and he came up with this series. It's called Self-Determining Haiti. It appeared in four parts in The Nation magazine. The Nation's still in print today. You might want to go and look up The Nation online sometime. There's a lot of good, lot of good reportage in there, and uh, this, is a, this is a classic uh, example of good reportage in The Nation, and then it was reprinted as a, a pamphlet after that, and uh, you can find it in various anthologies still. But what did Johnson say about Haiti in this self-determining Haiti series? He first of all detailed the role of the National Citibank of New York in pushing for the 1915 invasion. Citibank, Citibank is really the people that got the Marines to go in, and the first place the Marines went when they landed was straight to the National Bank of Haiti and they scooped up all of the bullion, the gold reserves, put it on a ship and sent it to Citibank. So think about that. Every time you pull out your Citibank credit card and use it, you're rattling a long chain when you do that. I have mine, you know, I, I'm Citibank too. But I think about that every time. He exposes the barbarous behavior of the occupation forces. Of course, many of the Southern Marines, many of the Marines were white Southerners and they went to Haiti and it was, you know, they were just on a rampage. But Johnson also, Johnson also asserts, this is important, he asserts the vibrancy of the peasants and the elites in Haiti. Now, a lot of people would go to Haiti and they really got into how sophisticated and worldly the elites were. Like, that's Langston Hughes. Or actually, no, he didn't like the elites. He did like the writer that he met. But Johnson is able to make a, a, a positive statement about the peasants and the elites in Haiti <clears throat> and discusses the problems of underdevelopment and illiteracy. He gets into everything in this uh, series of essays. Interestingly, he calls for literacy training in Haitian Creole. This is 1920. Literacy training in Haitian Creole, which he says, quote, must not be thought of as a mere dialect, end quote. And I'm going to read you another passage. This is, this is some great writing about Haiti, from, still from James Weldon Johnson. He, he writes about the urban poor, and he dignifies the urban poor and, like I said, the peasants, comparing both groups favorably to their U.S. and European counterparts. In Johnson's view, Port-au-Prince slums, quote, are, Port-au-Prince slums are no less picturesque and no more primitive, no humbler, yet cleaner. Anybody who's been to Del Mar or been to wherever you want to go in the, in the poor neighborhoods, it's clean once you get inside a house. It may be nasty on the street, it may be filthy on the street, but when you get inside a house, it's clean. And he got that in 1920. No humbler, yet cleaner than similar quarters in Naples, in Lisbon, in Marseille, and more justifiable than the great slums of civilization's centers, London and New York, which are totally without aesthetic redemption. Johnson sounds a similar note when describing a typical scene in the countryside. So that's what the, that's what the urban slums look like. Now he, here he is writing about the countryside. Peasant dwellings, he writes, quote, rarely consist of only one room, the humblest having two or three, with, little, with a little shed front and back, a front and rear entrance, and plenty of windows. An aesthetic touch is never lacking, a flowering hedge or an arbor with trained vines bearing gorgeous colored blossoms. There is no comparison between the neat plastered wall, thatched roof cabin of the Haitian peasant and the traditional log hut of the South or the shanty of the more wretched American suburbs. The most notable feature about the Haitian cabin is its invariable cleanliness, end quote. Now, let's jump ahead because I know I'm out of time already. So I want to get to, these are uh, Jesse Jackson's Charlene Hunter Galt as they looked more or less in the 1980s and early 90s when they were journalists very involved in uh, the period when the president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, was in exile in the United States. And you want to talk about somebody who could not get anything but bad press. That was Aristide, with the exception of these two. And that's part of my longer talk. But let's keep going. Now, these are some of the political figures that uh, also from the time of the 1980s up to the present moment have been very strong in advocating for uh, Haitian democracy. And you know that Haiti had a dictatorship for 30 years, from 1957 to 1986. It was the Duvalier family, father and son. And in 1986, popular democracy activism toppled that dictatorship. And so the, the, the period from 1986 to the present has been a kind of uh, 
series of, of uh, almost bloody efforts to get a popular government in place and then repression against it and then uh, you know the people come back and the popular movements come back and uh, these are some of the three of the of the most important uh, political advocates for that popular democratic movement over the last 25 years but I want to conclude with a poem and a reading of a poem by Jane Cortez one of my favorite, favorite uh, African-American writers, and I have a chapter on her in my book, and I think that, uh, you know, based on what you saw there, going all the way back to the Battle of Savannah, coming up through the revolutionaries like Denmark Vesey, the black abolitionists like William Wells Brown and uh, James T. Holly and Frederick Douglass, Douglass himself as an official diplomat, James Walden Johnson, the artists, the cultural strand from Hurston and Hughes, Jacob Lawrence, Catherine Dunham, on down to the journalists and the politicians in the present day, Jane Cortez is standing on top of a gigantic pyramid of cultural, political, intellectual uh, solidarity and activism. So when she sits down to write a poem about the bicentennial of Haiti, now you have some kind of an idea of where she's coming from by going back over that history. But let me, let me give you my reading of this poem, and I, I hope you all have a copy of the poem, right? Okay, here we go, and, and I'll be done. In literary expression, the Haitian African American linkage is perhaps best summed up in Jane Cortez's eloquent bicentennial tribute, Haiti 2004, published in her recent volume of poetry, The Beautiful Book. And she's since published another one called On the Imperial Highway, really, really good. And that's her best CD. She's also a, a recording artist and has as many CDs as she has books of poetry. And many people say that taking the blues back home is her best CD. Using powerful dialogic call and response techniques, Cortez evokes the pan-African legacy of Haitian culture. I say Fon, you say Yoruba. She evokes heroic figures from the Haitian past. I say Toussaint, you say Dessaline. I say Kristoff, you say pissed off. She evokes the problem of internal divisions in Haitian society. I say la coup de paysan, you say palace elite. And the, she evokes the constant pressure of predatory neo-colonial force. We say cancel the debt. They say blow up the green cards, sink all the boat people. In addition to registering Haiti in all its cultural and political complexity, Cortez makes clear that anyone trying to take the measure of Haitian history is confronted by a field of polarized and polarizing judgments within which one must struggle to find a point of orientation and articulation. So, poorest country in the hemisphere, first country to abolish slavery in the world. There is no government, there is local government. Voodoo is demonic, voodoo is all of those other things that I listed. Polarized and polarizing set of opposing views and you have to you have to take a position in that field it's not easy grounded in the legacy of political figures like Robinson Randall Robinson Maxine Waters James Weldon Johnson and Douglas from an earlier era and literary precursors like Hurston and Hughes Cortez developed delivers a moving portrait of Haiti and Haitians as on the one hand divided and suffering I say money be flying you say violence and poor people dying I say, you say, we say, Haiti be drinking punishment punch. But on the other hand, she presents an image of Haiti as moving forward from a revolutionary past into a troubled but sovereign future. Haiti be wanting to be Haiti. Not Haiti bye-bye, not Haiti why why, but Haiti, independent revolutionary Haiti. So that's my spiel on the Haitian African-American linkage, and I hope that it, that it challenges you to, in your, own, you know, in your own circles, in your own conversations, in your own mind, to embrace IET Cherie and to see that part of the way you get to that is by understanding and reflecting on the history of that African-American Haitian linkage.